Good morning, good evening, good night, NBN Entrepreneurship and Leadership. Personally, I'm fascinated by the story. Trust is an underrated weapon in the business landscape. I'm a really, really strong believer in learning by doing. What's the definition of success? You're trying to come up with an answer to the question. But go ahead, Richard. Uh, you could be right, but you're wrong. <laughs> good morning, good evening, good night, entrepreneurship and leadership listeners on the NBN. This episode is a special one. We're wrapping up season one, and I'm here with Keeman. Keeman, whereabouts in the world are you today? Ah, uh, you got me in my my love. I'm in my. I have a house in Crete, in somewhere in between. I don't know if how well you know Crete. In between the place called Ratimnon uh, Chania, got a nice little spot here, and I love to be here. I try to be here as much as possible. So, where are you, Richard? Well, I'm I'm actually in my sister's house in London. I'm quarantining because uh, the UK has quarantine for people coming in for. 10 days, I hope to do the test release tomorrow, but my sister has a nice, a nice house in South London. And what we're doing, listeners, um, we're obviously not here just to share our locations, but we thought that we'd reflect on the episodes that we've had in our first season, just to share some of the main takeaways we've got from it, and hopefully remind some of you of the, the great people we had and the ideas and stories they shared and maybe draw attention to things that you didn't spot during the episodes or else reinforce them. Kimon, anything else you want to do in this, this wrap up? Um, I mean, no, pretty much. I mean, the most important thing is that this has been really fun. Uh, I've never podcast. I've never done this before. Thank you, Richard, for, I, we talked about it for a while before we actually did it, but thank you for actually getting me to do it. Uh, I've, I've really enjoyed it. And I hope that the people that have listened as well, I mean, this is, um, I've learned so much from all these people and uh, I just look forward to continuing doing this. I, I just think this sort of wrap up is a nice little sort of summary of, of a season. So uh, yeah, and when we talk about seasons, Richard, so the next season will start sometime in September, October. Uh, we've decided to, to, <laughs> to have a break. We probably, the people may get tired of us and, and, and we'll enjoy this more if we, if we take breaks. So that's, that's, the, that, that's how we decided to set it up. That's right. Uh, but please, listeners, don't think of this. And thank you for listening. And of course, if you've got feedback and suggestions, we always want to hear that. But don't think of these as potted summaries of the entire episode. We just picked out a couple of thoughts on each of them. And the first guy who came on was the most amazing guy, uh, JT Jivon McCormick, who grew up as the son of a pimp, mother's prostitutes. I think he said he had 23 siblings. So he, he his, his, mother was, his mother wasn't a prostitute, I don't think. Well, he grew up surrounded by brush. He had a terrible, he had yes. a terrible childhood, yes, like the true. worst you can imagine. He wrote a book which you can all buy, which is basically the American dream. But what I really remember is how when he was a little boy, nine-year-old, watching his dad manage prostitutes, he was thinking like an entrepreneur. He was thinking, I wonder if my dad would make more money if he handled things differently. Like, is his dad handling his business of running prostitutes correctly as a nine-year-old kid. And that just led me to the reflection that you know, entrepreneurship can kick in really, really early. And there's loads to take away from that, that episode. And everyone should listen to it. Even if you just listen to one episode, listen to that one. It's quite incredible. But Keeman, what do you remember about that, that the, the, the Jivon story? I mean, Richard, that was, I mean, I remember exactly that situation uh, that you described. That was absolutely crazy. I mean, ultimately the story, is it's 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 so hard to believe because it's just like one it's like it's the story of a person that had the cards stacked against them right from the beginning like 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 basically like if you took like a textbook of how how to ensure that you won't be successful in life it would almost be <laughs> all these things that you know troubled childhood he came he came from a very very difficult uh, very difficult background um very you know a lot of people in his shoes would end up in jail or dead um, and so it wasn't only that he got out. I mean, getting out and just being alive and, and having a, a functioning life is fantastic, but he got out and he thrived. And that's a, I'd say that that's like a one in a, I don't know what the numbers are, but some crazy astronomical improbability. So for me, that was just the thing. It was just like to see this person to come, you know, and he was very humble the whole time. Um, it was very, he was, it was very important to him to acknowledge where he'd come from. Um, he had changed his name at one point because uh, uh, he wanted to blend in more. I think he was going by JT for a while, and then um, and then he realized that 
um, there, because it was because of racism, basically, people weren't answering his calls as Javon. And so he actually came very, very, you know, he came back to using Javon as his name. So, I mean, there's so many wrinkles to this story. I mean, it's just like, that was, that story had like, as you said, it's almost like a Hollywood, it's almost like a Hollywood story. Like basically it's got all these elements. And then somehow at the end, he manages to end up being, to be the CEO of this really cool company. Indeed. Um, Indeed. So yeah. And the next one we did, uh, was also really, really interesting. Uh, it was a, a, a woman called Tessa Clark. Uh, she founded a company called Olio, which is a, a very interesting app about um, how to basically to reduce food waste. So basically if you have extra food in your refrigerator, um, you know, it, it, it's an app so you can figure out who's in your neighborhood and you can give this extra food to. And yeah, obviously that app is like super cool and, it, and it's great for the environment and, and everything. But what I took away from that, she built this, they built, she, she was a business partner. They built this app to basically, you know, help food waste. But what, I, I don't know whether it was an intentional or unintentional consequence, but what they actually created was they created actually a community building app. Because if you think about it, actually, and they've gone beyond food. They give anything that you want to get rid of, you can put on your app and you can, and you can give it away. But generally, you're giving your stuff away to your neighbors. Because you're not going to go schlep across, you know, whatever, spend an hour driving to give something away. So basically, what they've done is, and this has become a very popular app, is that like people are really getting to know their neighbors and their community as a result of this. And 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 so I think that's just like like a very I like the in, unintended consequence of. And I don't know, I you know, she might say that that was that was part of the intention. But for me, just listening to the story, I found that that to be a really interesting uh, aspect of it. Yeah, and Tessa, Tessa was a, a, a great a great story. And, you know, to the extent that Givon came from the bottom, Tessa and her co-founder were quite privileged. And I mean, you know, she, they, what, she was at Cambridge, they met at Stanford, they both had like glittering careers. And so, and I don't think, and I, we didn't dig that deep into Tessa's background. She grew up on the farm, but, you know, a farmer in the UK can be prosperous, a farmer in the UK can be poor. It doesn't tell you that much, but she obviously did well. Uh, I mean, she did get her MBA from Stanford. Exactly, as did my co-founder, who was called yeah. Celestial One. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but the the other thing was that she was like an accidental entrepreneur. She she stumbled into it because she got really upset about waste when she was moving from Switzerland, I think, back to the UK. But there was just this sense, and that would be a great one to listen to for anyone who's basically successful, doing well in life, to realize that you know suddenly out of the blue, you can head off in a completely different direction. And boy, was she intentional in her, and she did everything right. They didn't raise money to start with. They, they, they talked to customers, they were on the street. It's a, it's a perfect case study for the people who, maybe you don't think you're gonna be an entrepreneur, but if you wanna hear what it might be like, if you're basically doing okay in your life and you're gonna head off in that direction, that would be, that would be, the, one to, that would be the one to consider listening to. And then, uh, yeah, so that was, uh, that was Tessa. Next up, we actually had Veronique, who's the CEO of Argos Multilingual, which is a company Kimon founded, and I was lucky enough to get in extremely early and as an investor. And Veronique's story is really the, the story of how drive and competitiveness and ambition can make your career entrepreneurial, because she absolutely wasn't like coming out of high school saying, I am going to be an entrepreneur, but now she's a shareholder and our business partner. And it's, it's this mixture of luck, recognizing luck, having the right mentors, recognizing when she went off in the wrong direction. I think she went to, off to try to be a diplomat to start with, and that didn't work out. And also she wanted to get away from her hometown. The small town really was not, not big enough for her. And she's very open, humble, competitive. I, I wouldn't say tough as nails, but something in the same sort of spaces nails <laughs> you know something metallic or very hard leather Bra brass knuckles yeah well i, I would just <laughs> I'd go totally into sales and you know i feel i've dressed her up as being aggressive extremely good interpersonal skills and yeah you know, I, I feel very privileged to be in business with her which is all to do with chemo but chemo i mean you know her so well I, is there yeah i'm not even know? yeah it's, it's hard for me to even be objective and also how how do i how do i even like um sort of take out the parts that were actually in the podcast from just what I know. But uh, but the funny thing that I do remember about the podcast that I didn't know though was that her parents were, I believe they had a, like a flower, a flower business. I wouldn't call it a flower shop because it was more, it was bigger than that. I think they farmed, they, they, had, they, had, quite a, they had quite a lot. And uh, I did think it was interesting that she did end up on the, 
on the front of, uh, you know, client facing there at a young age, basically. And, you know, and that, you know, that's back to what I think you mentioned. That's what you used in the Javon, but I think a lot of these people have this. I think that's a, that's a common thread with these successful entrepreneurs and, uh, and leaders is that they, that they showed the ability at an early, at a young age. But uh, yeah, so, you know, I mean, Vernick's gone on to use all of those skills. I mean, and, and it is really just what you said. I mean, like she took advantage of, uh, of opportunities that were given to her, um, but she's, you know, a very driven person and you could see it throughout the story and, you know, just had a, has the, she's just the full package. She had the mix of all the skills. And as she went through her story, you saw, oh, I take something out of this toolkit. Oh, I'll take something out of that toolkit. And, and that's how she, that's how she progressed forward. Yeah. And, and also um, I think for, for, for the sort of entrepreneurial career, I think someone who sort of feels they're entrepreneurial, th this shows how just having a regular career and doing your job extremely well and creatively can lead you into ownership of a company. If you play your cards, it's a mixture of hard work and luck, but mainly it's talent and commitment and drive and being ready to put her money where her mouth is, because it's not just a question. I'm not sure if that's in the podcast, but the outcome. Yeah, this, well, this that's, not, that's probably not in there, but that's, that's, I mean, I think that's a valuable, I mean, um, but you know, but even, well, I, I, this can be a good segue to our to our next one, but like I think because the next the next guest also has a similar story in the sense that you have sort of I don't want to call it a corporate um, career, but you have this sort of very professional career where you actually make a lot of money basically throughout it because you're you're highly highly recognized for, for being you know very good at what you do, and then transitioning that and taking 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 the you know the fruits of your labor the money that you made and then in investing into something that you that, that you yourself have an ownership interest in which is exactly what Vernik did and it's what Ashutosh Garg did which was the, the 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 episode after that um so he's a super interesting guy from India um and he followed that very very I would say traditional route of like extremely extremely good education um and then sort of big corporations worked for the top companies. Um, and, you know, and then at some point, you know, he decided he was gonna retire. And I thought that was the funny, the sort of like thing in that episode is he was like, <laughs> he said, okay, I'm done at like 50. I can't don't know, remember how old, he was like 50 or something. He said, I'm done, I'm gonna play golf now. And that lasted for a couple of weeks. And then he, he was back trying to figure something out. He ended up setting up the, the largest, I believe pharmaceutical chain, pharmacy chain in uh in india and then proceeded to sell that um but the thing that really stuck with me about ashutosh to be honest with you is this guy is so prolific i mean there are people like i, I wish i could be as prolific <laughs> and have as much energy to do as much work as ashutosh does because you know he's now what has he written i don't know he's wrote like seven books or something like that he's set up this this podcast it's like going i mean this is what he's done now in his third or fourth career at this point you know, he's just chugging away <laughs> and producing. He's producing content. He's writing books and he's producing podcasts. So, like, I don't know that. Work, I don't. I don't want to call it. It's not work ethic because work ethic sounds like you know you're a hard worker. It's you're just you have a lot of energy and you want to do it. You want to you want to use it in this way, basically. And I and I think that that's that. Anyway, that's that's something that stuck out with me about him. Yeah, and and Ashutosh. He, I mean. There's a certain type of person, like some kind of entrepreneurs, and I don't know, I was speaking for myself, where, you know, I've got the right credentials on paper, but I don't necessarily fit in that well in the sort of corporate environment. And there's a, a lot of entrepreneurs, they're a bit too sort of like rough and, ready, rough and ready and, you know, don't always do exactly the right thing. But Ashutosh just looks like the kind of guy who would fit in perfectly. You know, you can imagine him at Davos, you can imagine him on the panel of a big conference in a big <laughs> fancy hotel. And he would just like, Totally blend in as just a smart, so, professional, yeah. all about process, culture, style, beautifully educated, very loyal family man. And then you look at what he's doing, and he's not being the regular guy. He's setting things up. He's quitting his job. He's cranking out podcasts <laughs> and books. And, you know, is is a real eye opener and just this sort of sense. And it's something that we're really glad to bring bring to you, bring to our listeners, people from different cultures, and you know what they have in common. Like when he set up that individual, he called it the boots of. India boots was the 
used to be the biggest retail pharmacy chain in the UK, like Walgreens or something like that for Americans. But, you know, this is a huge, huge venture. But he set up the first one. <laughs> you know, he and at the time he did it, that didn't exist. And it was all about process, all about culture, all about, you know, this sort of getting things right. And you can learn a lot. He, he's a sort of business school case study type type guy and also an inspiration because, you know, just. But yeah, as you said, I think that a lot of that process, um, again, and this is back to the, the, there's more than one way to skin a cat. And why, do, by the way, I've always wondered, why do people say skin a cat? Do people skin cats? I think this, I always had there's more than one way to skin a rabbit, but um, cool. okay, but that makes more sense. I, I, have only, out, but, I have only skinned a rabbit once, and I'm but <laughs> anyway, off, I, there's one more, there's more than one way to achieve your goal, uh, or to get to become, let's say, an entrepreneur. And, and, and I think what we're talking about here is because there's these some of these people that just go off and do it, like that's what they do, that's who they are, that's what they start doing, and then there's these what I, these professional people, and I think Ashutosh and, and a lot, and, and even Veronique, that we just mentioned, I mean. They learned a lot. I mean, they learned a ton from their, you know, from working in these big companies and, and successful companies. And basically then they took that knowledge. It's like a continued education and they're just totally ready to lead and, and, and create new things. Right. And I, I uh, that le leads on to a very different type of entrepreneur, Florian Faiser, who's the founder of Slater, which is you know, what, what the premier or certainly one of the premier sort of information hubs of the global translation industry. And his, um, what I took away from his story, and he set this up, he'd been in sales. And as a sales guy, he came across the problem that he couldn't find the data he needed on the industry he was in anywhere. And he knew someone in business to business publications and together they figured out that it was just an, an opportunity that it wasn't there. But Florian had the street smarts, which is a really necessary part of entrepreneurship. And there was things like when he was, in, he was doing his academic study of translation, he, he specialized, I think he did his PhD or his, his thesis about tools or translation tools. And he ended up like interviewing the CEOs of companies about the way they were doing things. And he, he, he Kimon was trying to push him a bit on this, but you just had a sense that this guy was very smart and he saw opportunities. Like he got himself into the right place. People talk about luck and all the entrepreneurs recognize the role of luck. And people who listen to the show regularly will know we always ask about luck, but he got himself into the situations in the room where he could be lucky because he was in front of the right people at the right time. And, and you know, for the people who don't come, and you could say anyone born in Switzerland is privileged. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's say luck number one, <laughs> luck number one, being born in Switzerland. Yeah, no, but there, there is a sense of like being in, born in the right country, but, you know, he clearly basically didn't come from like, you know, the sort of the moneyed background where life was like laid out for you. He really built his own opportunities and took his opportunities. And, you know, that's a very encouraging story for people who don't necessarily, you know, feel that they got got the the everything lined up for them by other people in their lives. So Kima, what did you take away from our chapter, Florian? Well, yeah, Florian's another person I know quite well. Um, what, what cracked me up, uh, what I didn't know about him was that he his main study was to become an electrician, <laughs> and, and he very and he very, and he very uh, openly he very openly said he wasn't a very good electrician, um, and so the the uh, obviously Florence super smart and, um, and and this comes back to the idea of it's not only education for me, um, it, it that's another theme that comes back again. It's like and and I think that that came out a lot with Florian is that look. Um, you know, and then it was sort of haphazard, the whole thing, right? I mean, he, was, he studied to become an electrician, and then he thought, hey, I can do this translation diploma thing. And then, and then the entrepreneurial side, as you pointed out, he, he got, so he, he, just to sort of complete your story, Richard, he said he was sitting in the, he was interviewing this, because he basically was doing this um, study on tools and nobody knew anything about tools. And so they, they had to get like a, a CEO from a big translation company to interview so that the professor, the professor had to get somebody like that because otherwise nobody could assess what Florian had written. And so he had the opportunity to meet the CEO and he asked the CEO for a job, <laughs> which is just a very direct thing to do. And then he took it from there. I mean, that, that was the launch of his, of his uh, sort of entrance into translation. But again, you know, we didn't go into every single detail, but you just know 
that he didn't just go to Asia. He went to Asia and lived there for 10 years and ended up setting up the whole thing and being the general manager there. And, you know, I'm sure it was just situation after situation that he was, uh, I, I would I would say Florian fits into the street smart sort of group, right? He's like into the, into the like, uh, yeah, he figures out this is the best thing to do. And so that for me is the more, yeah, the sort of the classic type of, I don't know, like um, instinctive entrepreneur or something like that. So yeah, that's, that's, that's where I was with him. Yeah. And then we had Mungo. Our business oh yeah, it's my turn to do the intro for this one. And then well, after we had Mungo. You met the, the sharp listener will take it. Notice we're taking in turns to introduce people and it's Kimon's going to introduce Mungo. Yeah, we've got the model. I introduce and then comment, introduce, comment, introduce, comment. So yeah, Mungo's another guy Richard and I know really well. Uh, he runs a business that um, I founded, and again, Richard invested in at a, quite an early stage. Uh, it's a company that, called PMR that both Richard and I were are not only shareholders, and we were actually both CEOs at various times um, in the 20-year history of this company. But anyway, Mungo runs it now, and uh, very interesting story. Mungo comes from, actually, Mungo has a very similar background to us, Richard, in that he came to Poland like we did. Um, he came from South Africa but he came in the early 90s. So basically he was an expat who moved to Poland in the early 90s and uh, basically ended up setting up and, and, and doing business here. Uh, he was he ended up getting involved in a family business. He was working with his wife's uh, dad's company. But uh, you know, as Richard and I know, the early 90s of Poland and doing business, it was a bit of the wild west or whatever you wanna call it, the wild east. Um, but the one story, that, and there was lots of stories in there, but the one that like stuck with me um, is the story about how he had to drive around. He said he did thousands and thousands and thousands in his car. He drove around and he would drive these all these distances to just have one sales meeting. <laughs> and like the effort that people, it's the resilience. And, and it took him years to get this thing off the ground, to get actually any sales going for that company. And so like, I don't know, for me, like that is, a, is one of those, like that the resilience, and the tenacity, um, that's, what, that, that, that's a common thread that you see with a lot of these people and a lot of the entrepreneurs. Um, I don't know whether you had a favorite sort of excerpt from Mungo, but. I mean, I, mean, I, th I think the, this is a, th that story is one that will appeal to people who think what might happen to me if I like started again in a new country, the sort of immigrant on, entrepreneur. And like, to be fair, Kimon, myself and uh, Mungo, we all came from like, countries that were relatively successful compared to Poland at the time we came. And, you know, it's a bit different if you're a young Ukrainian girl going to UK or Russian guy, maybe not Russian, a Polish guy going to Germany, that you're kind of, you're moving from low income country to high income. We came in slightly different direction, although South Africa, of course, isn't quite the same as America or the UK. But that immigrant story is an interesting one because there are so many opportunities if you just drop in somewhere like then and it's not easy. It's not an easy opportunity, but there is something about being new in town where you've got, you don't have a choice. You have to make your own way. You, you're not, you don't, you don't necessarily fit into the local, local. Hey, Richard, I'm just curious. I have to ask, cause I just, you just reminded me of something. How many times did people ask you when I would say, yeah, where, where, you know, where, where are you from? Like back in the early days, like, where are you from? I was like, yeah, I was born in New York. And they were like, why? <laughs> No, why, why are you why are you here <laughs> what's, the, the, what's wrong with you i actually met mungo at krakow stand-up comedy and um aditya is uh, one of the best he's an indian who does very good stand-up he says my name is adi as in adidas <laughs> and, he, uh, he, and he he um he always said like poland's in crazy country because like the first thing anyone says to you is like you say you're from india say why poland like you have to be absolutely crazy to come here and poland's a great country i mean it's got minuses like everywhere but you know there's so many pluses but polish people can't quite believe it but anyway coming back to the the, the, you're absolutely right to draw attention to that. The, the sort of making your way in a new country was one side of it. The other thing that Mungo had, which a lot of entrepreneurs haven't had, which is worth listening to, that the company he was closely associated was sold to one of the biggest Jap Japanese conglomerates, Mitsubishi. So he, he actually had like the transition from small company world to big company world, and then back again out. But you know that is something that a lot of people imagine might happen one day. He's been there and done that. And I think there's something about that story, which 
obviously you won't find out all the details of that, but to go from like small town, small town, small country distribution of stuff into being part of Mitsubishi automation or electric or whatever bit it was. And yeah, and that was actually, you're mentioning, you talk a little bit about culture, but this guy, I mean, Mongo really went, he came from South Africa, went to Poland, but then a went big part of his life, he lived in Japan. He had to live in Japan and like, yeah. there was a pure Japanese company. He was doing Japanese uh, culture stuff and Japanese management stuff. So, and he, he actually implements a lot of that in PMR now, but I, but totally, I mean, like, that is a totally different thing. And he was and he was doing that basically. And, and, and you know, I think there's there's also something that you know when you sign up for this entrepreneurship journey, you are people say, oh, you're going to be in charge. Being in charge actually means that you get you take your company in the direction that's best for your company. And the best thing for them was to exit to Mitsubishi, and that basically involved him going somewhere. So you know, obviously, in the long run, if the money works out, you become free because you've got enough money not to do that anymore. If that's how, depending on the structure of the deal, which of course is just because doesn't always work out for everyone like that. However, you know, he ended up in Japan as part of the deal. And when a company gets bought, sometimes the guys who run it get bought with got what they call it golden handcuffs for a while. So that was that was Mungo. And then we had someone, uh, Renato Beninato from the translation industry again. And he is, I really enjoy talking to him. He's a very engaging speaker, both on the podcast and just like, he's the guy in the bar who's always got a story. He's always got things to say. And not just, there are people who talk a lot who don't have intelligent things to say, but he's a born consultant. He's got smart things, well-informed things to say. He does workshops. He's a good teacher. But the thing that really struck me about his story was how, you know, his he was such an entrepreneurial journey. He had the idea there was problems in Brazil back when he was a teenager that involved setting up a typewriter as a copying service before word processing. And he didn't, it wasn't about translation, but there was something wrong with the idea, which you can discover in the podcast. But that one thing led to another. He was always on the lookout for a problem that he could solve, something that he could do, leading to an extraordinary situation where they stumbled into a massive business opportunity that involved a big client coming to visit them when they didn't have a suitable office. And so he borrowed a friend's, I think it was a computer school. It was a school. Yeah, it was a school for training. <laughs> and he had like family and friends coming in pretending to be employees just to look right. And you know, this guy is a professional guy. He's a successful guy. He's a reliable guy. But there was that moment when the scale of the opportunity exceeded the thing that he had at that time built. I think it, it wasn't general electrics or general dynamics but it was some big American corporate. And um, yeah, so and you know, this is just like, a nice entrepreneurial story of someone who's always looking for an opportunity, taking an opportunity, making an opportunity, looking for the deal. And there's, a, there's something like the entrepreneurial mindset and approach to life. And you can get that in spades out of listening to that story. And, and uh, I, I, that's what I took from that. And it's definitely the sort of story that inspires a certain type of person to think, yeah, I'm like that. This is me. What about you, Kimo? Yeah, I mean, so again, Renat's another person I know quite well. Uh, but the idea, I think one of, I think a, a defining aspect of Renato, Renato's personality is that he's a first adopter and he's also very brave. He's not, he's ready to try new things and, you know, trying new things can be, I'm trying the latest technology. I'm trying the latest social platform, but also in the case of business, I'm ready to take risks. I'm ready to try, you know, as you, as you, as you put that, the funny story about creating this fictional company, uh, fictional looking company, so that he could, so he could land the deal. But there was tons of stuff. And, he, and, and, and I also very much enjoy, he was very um, sort of open about making mistakes. Uh, like, he did, like, he did, like he basically admitted, which is, which is, which is if, like, if, if you think that anybody gets through and gets to the top without screwing up tons along the way, well, you're, 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 you're not, realistic and you know and, and and that's the truth is that you have to go through try 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 and 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 this is like even what you know i've been saying this forever i it's better to do something and be wrong than do nothing and basically i think a lot of people get paralyzed by fear oh my god what if i don't get it right and you know what i've learned and 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 and, and i'm sure renato would agree with this is that you know good enough is often good enough <laughs> and and a lot of people can't let go of that they need to have it perfect they need to do it absolutely perfect and sometimes you just need to do it good enough and and, and you know because there's so much you could say about Renato's story and it goes on and on it's huge it goes you know he's from Brazil he ends up you know 
running stuff in Eastern Europe and the U.S. and and you know and then back to the U.S. and he's all over the world. Um, but it's it's these it's it's I think it's these fundamental it's these fundamental things of not being brave, being ready to try things first, uh, and feeling that things are good enough is the thing to get get you get you get you places fast. Basically, you've, you've actually triggered a thought there, Kimon, which is I think that we have in common that we're both we both are very like aware of our own good fortune our own luck we don't see our successes as all about our own individual talents to the extent we're successful though we're really happy to see uh, how far that's dependent on other people and this and because we're not so full of ourselves and how wonderful we are i think we to some extent have been able to bring that out of the people we've been talking to because sometimes in business culture uh, there's such a tendency for people to big themselves up, talk themselves up. And just by being open and honest, so many of them have admitted or revealed that in their childhood, it was tough. <laughs> they screwed up. It wasn't all perfect. And there's a, there's two types of self-confidence. There's the self-confidence where people never admit to a weakness. And then there's the self-confidence that most of the people, men and women we had on our on, on our show had, which is the self-confidence. I mean, yeah, sure, I screwed up, but that doesn't make me a bad person. That just means that I'm human. <laughs> I'm human and actually I, that's part being open to the fact that things might not work out, be ready to turn in a different direction is, is important and that we got that from Renato and it was really great that you managed to get him on the show and now you're going to tell us about our next <laughs> <laughs> uh, Good segue then, Richard, excellent segue, way to, way to, way to, way to handle that. Uh, one of my favorites, I'll be honest with you, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to pick favorites, but I honestly think one of my favorites was Shimon Swupik. Um, so Shimon is a, a Polish entrepreneur. Uh, he founded a company um, that it, I think it was called CDN. Is that right? CDN. That's yeah. Right. And and the, the funny thing is that this was like the accounting software we all used in the early '90s. Like Richard and I, and all of our companies, everybody hit him. He must have had a monopoly on this. Um, but in the, he ended up founding that company and selling it. Um, what I liked about him, and he had a great story. I mean, amazing story. Like first of all, like. Uh, also, the owner at a young age, like he would go, he would take a train to Warsaw and buy a tape recorder. And of course, he was an engineer and technical, and he'd fix it himself. And then he'd go to the flea market, and he'd sell it. <laughs> that would be one. <laughs> and then when he saved up enough money, he'd buy two and three and so on, basically. And he was very entrepreneurial. And then he went to pick the strawberries or whatever. He went somewhere to Norway, and the guy stopped on the side of the road and was like, Do you know how strawberries or whatever they were picking? And him and his friend were like, of course we know how to make sure we're experts. <laughs> They'd never done it before. So, you know, all that stuff is, is, is hilarious. But I really like, uh, and that is all like classic and interesting and all that. But he just struck me. He's, he's clearly a very, very successful person. And, he's, and he, is, he is very humble. I, I really liked how soft-spoken and humble he was about all his successes. And also, um, he, I, he, he writes a blog and he's very sort of interested in environmental issues and social issues, and which I, which I think is, is, is really cool. And we didn't talk a, much about it. We talked a little bit about it. Richard, you got us off the track when, I, when, when we started talking about it because uh, you, you felt like we need to follow our rigid. <laughs> I'm just poking <laughs> a little fun here. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he, we, basically, he's been flagging for a long time that uh, Elon Musk and Tesla buying Bitcoin didn't make any sense because the, uh, Tesla has this great sort of environmentally friendly, uh, friendly sort of uh, persona and PR uh, side to it. And, you know, and obviously Bitcoin, I mean, if you've heard or you haven't heard, it's actually not very uh, environmentally friendly. It, it consumes a lot of energy to produce it. And um, so I just think that, and he was going on and on about this, like he was raving about this for a little, well before. And finally, obviously, for those of you who don't know, uh, Elon Musk had to come out and say, "Look, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to use Bitcoin anymore uh, it's, uh, until it becomes more environmentally friendly, and so on and so forth." But I just think it's, um, I think it's great to have people who are thinking beyond the money and beyond the business. Shimon clearly has has done well, but he's trying to make a difference. I think he's trying to make a difference socially, um, and yeah, and that, and that, you know, and I just, I just, I mean, he's just a super cool, laid back guy. Yeah, and the, the additional things I'd take away from that is one is that for someone who's like trying to get a sense of what communist era entrepreneurs are like, 
you know, there's this sort of the media image of the sort of the gangster oligarch is something that you'll pick up if you read a Western newspaper these days. And but to someone to get the real entrepreneurs, the people who've built, and it's not just Poland, it's all the countries of Central Eastern Europe, there are like these really smart men and women who just like work their way up. And it's his story is so typical of not everyone, because not everyone made it. But, you know, for, if you're looking into the background of some of the most successful entrepreneurs in the region, they all had like these little things that they build up and they build up. And he's super smart, extremely well educated, as Kingman said, modest. And there's also a really interesting evolution that, you know, he was he's quite open about how he was quite materialistic. He liked his toys. He liked his his comfortable living standard. And then once he exited the company, he realized he had enough money never to work again. And it took him a little time to recalibrate. And then he realized that actually that wasn't enough and he wanted to do more in his life. And again, this is something that might be extremely valuable for someone who's you know, going into business to think, I want to make enough money so I'll never have to work again. This is someone who did that. And now they're working extremely hard on a very challenging project. It's, you know, there are things going well with Silver, this Bluetooth mesh lighting system. We're not talking about what the business does, but just that's a great one to listen to if you want to get a sense of communist era entrepreneurship stretching up into the present. But lots to learn from his story. And I will, I'll post a link again to his blog in the show notes because that's a great read, short, highly educated insights into technology and society. And then we had a, a guy who I know much better than Kimon, Michael Blakey, who I think he got out, he was up after midnight in order to do the interview. Uh, Michael won't be upset to say he looked a bit scruffy because he always looks a bit scruffy. <laughs> so we put on clean shirts. I think he, I think at the end of a long day in Singapore, he, you know, it looked like it had been a long day. But, what, what, but the funny thing about Michael Blake is if you look at him online, he looks like a super respectable guy. He's had a fund, you know, he's part of a very sort of elegant world of professional uh, VC angel seed investing. And then when you talk to him, he's a total out of control rule breaker. <laughs> does the loads of things. It's, he went off to, he's strongly dyslexic. He hated schoolwork. He did things like large scale illegal parties in the United States in order to pay his way through, through college. And, you know, just hearing someone who you think is going to be like the respectable dude, you know, the man in a suit. And he was definitely not the man in a suit. He was, and he said, he just, he always figured out he'd do things and then figure out how to do them after he had started. And, you know, that was just like, it doesn't quite fit any pattern. His life worked for him. He was in prison. He's also in business with his brother. He's obviously very fond of his brother. He's, he said his brother was more like the numbers guy. He was more the, I'm not sure what his side was, but whatever it was, it works. But Ideas, creative. Creative. And just a, a really unusual animal in the sort of entrepreneurial ecosystem with his fund in London, fund in, fund in Singapore. And I, I'm not sure what, just, it's, it's just an unusual, interesting story, but and highly successful and extremely um, full of himself, I thought. Kimo, what did you take? Yeah, yeah, from? yeah, he was also, well, I mean, you, you touched on a couple of things. Um, well, first of all, he sold, so like, again, he's another one of the, 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 the young age entrepreneurs, right? I think he went off to boarding school at a young age and he was making money. Uh, he was, first of all, the guy was always making money. Yeah, he was smuggling vodka. Sorry, that just, <laughs> like that just, and, and he didn't need, and, and I, I don't, and Richard, just to correct, I don't believe that he needed it. I think he was fully financed by his parents. So any money that he made wasn't because he had the, he was like struggling through to survive. It was just, a, he was just making extra money because it's nice to have money. And so, you know, I think he started selling candy when he first went to boarding school. So, you know, I think Richard asked him, it was like, how do, what was your margin? It was like, I buy for one, sell for two. Um, and then, you know, and then as he got older, then the candy turned into alcohol. <laughs> he buy one, sell for two at the boarding school. And then as Richard mentioned, he went to college and then that turned into doing parties and stuff like that. And for me, again, one of the big takeaways, again, you mentioned the dyslexia. And I think that that was a... I think that was a defi I think you would agree. I think that was a defining moment. I think that was a defining aspect of him and his childhood was that he had to battle through something. So he went through school all the way through school, through hard, good schools as well. And, um, and he, he, for sure, he couldn't do it the traditional way. So I'm not even talking about like outside, like we were joking about stuff like bending the law and stuff like that. <laughs> even within the structures of the way the school worked, 
he was able to get through school basically and find ways to do the things that worked for him so that he could get past the classes and get through. And I think that that, um, you want to call it resilience or this way of solving problems in different ways, finding different ways to solve problems, different ways of skinning the cat. If we're going to be skinning cats on this episode, whatever he, 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 he was, uh, he, he was, I think that's what his, I think that's what his skill was. And then I think he's brought that to his angel investing thing. So he comes in and he sees his business and he looks at it. And then, he, and, and I think he's heavily involved on a, in a hands-on basis on helping the founders um, get there. I, he works at the very early stages, actually. Doesn't he mm -hmm. only work with seed, like just the like seed? I think he only works with seed. Um, and then, you know, he, 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 he helps them get their business up and running. So, so it's, it's sort of that skill. I think he's, he's taken it and applied it to business. I mean, for someone with, a, with an idea and a bit of money and, or maybe not so much money, but just like some, something that's really going to work, they'd be very interesting people to have as co-founders. They come in almost as co-founders rather than just a fund. I think they, they're way more involved than normal. Anyway, that, that was, uh, that, that was uh, a pleasure to have him on the show. And then, then we had Vasco, didn't we? Yeah, we had Vasco Pedro, the CEO of a company called Unbabble. Uh, it's a Portuguese-based, uh, quite successful startup. I think their last round of financing might have been a C level, and they got sixty million bucks or something like that. Um, and yeah, a lot of interesting things we had with Vasco. But I think one of the key takeaways, like for me, like the the, the funniest, like the, one of the most interesting things, and I think a lot of these people who come from the startup world um, may may sort of uh, understand this a bit better, is that he said that you know if if Unbabble goes public and becomes a billion dollar company people will say, oh, wow, that was an overnight success. <laughs> but the reality is that not only has it not, has he been, I don't know how long he's been doing it, for eight years or 10 years, he's been doing on Babel for quite a number of years. But before that, he did a number of startups as well. And he's, he's another case of you go through, you fail, you learn, you try something new. Very open. Vasco was very open to talk about you know, what didn't work, <laughs> what, what didn't work in the past, wh wh what he hopes is going to work in the future. So, um, yeah, I thought that that, I thought that that little nugget of like, people look at these companies and they think that they're overnight successes, <laughs> but they're like overnight successes, 20 years in the making. Um, I don't know what you, uh, what, Absolutely. I think one of the, uh, Vasco is a good one to listen to if you're interested to hear it from the sort of classic American, establishment top tier type business you know they had a the, to get 60 million bucks i think the valuation of the company was 250 million dollars or a really big valuation so tons and tons of money top tier y combinator the most famous accelerator in the world and it you know all the things that can go wrong. super brainy i think it was mass mit so you know super brainy people doing really hard technical things with tons of money coming in and yet you know, all, and he was saying that it was misleading. He talked about, he, he, because it's the sort of Steve Jobs world. He talked about reality distortion fields. He knows all the theory and he's not just the guy who knows it because he's read about it. He's living it, he's doing it. And it's not easy. I mean, he, it's clearly highly stressful. He's clearly not a, not a sort of just because the money's there doesn't take away all the pressure. <laughs> and so it, it's not dressing up this, glitteringly successful super brainy guy surrounded with highly intelligent team where money isn't a problem for hiring talent and yet and yet disrupting the world of translation with a really cool or trying to with a really cool product and technology yeah there was a whole ai there was a whole ai side of that as well which is interesting so he's a real expert i mean they're basically that he's running it that, that's why they got that's why they get and they're getting lots of money is because they're an ai Basically, an AI comp enabled company, um, and you know they're and uh, and he also just had some like really cool. Like I think we were asking, weren't we asking about Neuralink? Is, is he going to plug stuff into his brain? Or not? Like he just knew a lot. Also about he just knows a lot about you know what's going on with AI. Totally, um, totally. totally. And then from when we went had a Polish entrepreneur, Andrzej Niedoma, and was there are quite a few interesting aspects to his story. And one of them is that it's a family business. He watched his dad set up this business, but it was really he became like a co-founder in his dad's business because at the time that they started growing. He was basically the second employee, that it was just his dad running a small business, translation business. But then there was this really nice sort of story of how he and his dad saw the potential of the industry and grew up this little company to something much bigger. And again, what's the lesson to learn? Someone listening to this might be that person whose dad's or mama's got a little business and 
seeing the story of how he turned it into something bigger and then the opportunity we don't need to go into the details the opportunities he discovered as a, you know, a business need that that business had that he thought other companies would need and how everyone said it was a great idea and all the people who said it was a great idea didn't turn around and buy it and then there's the, there's the whole fundraising side they raised external capital they ended up buying the company back from the external capital providers sometime later and but the other thing that was two takeaways one was that he said there's a permanent unhappiness like he was never satisfied he always wanted more he was always pushing himself and he was always had that and there's, there's that kind of hunger that the complacent person probably isn't going to be a happy on isn't going to be a happy entrepreneur because if you're complacent it's not going to work you can't be complacent um and an entrepreneur and the other thing was just like his his second life his uh as a as a coach as a guru he as a public speaker he's got this unrealized ambition to as in his own words to be the tony robbins of of poland and you know just the open no not of poland of the world so, sorry the tony yeah a, <laughs> bit, a bit but just this sort of sense that he was completely open yet he's a lot of by a lot of people's eyes a successful guy giving advice to other entrepreneurs and yet it's not enough he wants more and great great things to learn from his story i think yeah i cracked up um when uh I like sort of how we got into the translation business. So, so just by pure chance, I was mentioning that the, the first time I met him was at this translation conference in Italy that we both, by the way, drove each of us separately, like 17 hours to go to back to doing anything you have to do to get your business going. But so he was a kid and he went to this, <laughs> to this conference and he saw all the fancy cars outside. They were all like Mercedes and BMWs or whatever they were. And he was like, wow, this translation industry this is a this is the place to be and it was only years later that he found out that there was also a medical conference going on there and there were like doctors but like let's thank the medical conference for for bringing Anje into into the translation industry because because he saw all those fancy cars and all these trans, translation industry because we uh, you know it's, it's a pretty it's a pretty attractive thing yeah. but um yeah um, the, the thing yeah. about Anje is, this Anjay's story in particular is I don't think I've never heard a story where so yeah, as you said, co-founding, and I really do think that's a quite accurate description, co-founding with your dad, right? Building it up, selling it, setting up another company within it, getting VC funding for that company, buying the shares back from the VC company, and being once again the owner of that company, those all those components together, I've never heard of that sort of that scenario. And like, and he's also very young. I mean, he's a very young guy. And then so he's gone off, and now he's he's doing. You know, he's obviously has tons of experience. But thanks to all this experience, he'd be obviously a very good coach uh, yeah. and mentor for somebody. But you know, and then you know, as Richard said, um, you know, Tony Robbins too. Look out, he's coming from Krakow. So. Yeah, yeah watch that's a good one. Check, check out Angie oh. Nijuma. The name will be up in bright lights on the show stadium, <laughs> maybe. Uh, but seriously, it's a great listen. Then we had David Spinks. What do you remember? No, no, I had, uh, I think it was me. I had, uh, I had, uh, we had Greg Rosner on. After we got that. out of order. And, we got out of order. Our first mistake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, Greg, um, uh, Greg's also a person I've known for a number of years. He's, he founded a company called Pitch Kitchen. He's based in New York. And, uh, Greg, um, Greg, Greg comes from a sales background and the company that he set up basically is it, it helps companies with their marketing uh, collateral. So with their sales presentations and with their website and stuff like that. And I think I thought we, Richard, I thought we had a really interesting conversation about sales and marketing actually on that podcast. I think that's actually a topic we should probably explore a little more uh, going forward. I think it's probably something a lot of people care about. But sort of the upshot of what he was saying and what he, how he's helping companies is, is, is a lot of people are um, just presenting themselves. So they're like, hey, I'm Kimon company and I'm the best. I'm founded in this year and I have this many employees. And he, the point is that it's all about me. And really, when you're talking to the client, it really needs to be all about the client. And he was, he was really bringing the idea that you should be telling stories and the client should be the hero of every story that you tell basically and you should be the guide that helps the hero go through his adventure and helps the hero win at the end basically and so you know he'd love to use like star wars as like you know be you know yoda uh, to luke skywalker who's going through the process and, and luke skywalker is the hero of the film and i thought that that was a really interesting thing um and like 
could be really valuable for a lot of um, just salespeople to understand. Totally, totally. And, um, you know, I, I like the, you know, this is, he's an example of the entrepreneur where, you know, as a guy doing corporate sales, he discovered how bad the presentations were that he was expected to sell with. So he became, as a result of being in a corporate environment, he realized there has to be a better way of providing this. And so this is a classic entrepreneurial story where you discover a problem, a really niche problem inside a large organization. You think, hmm, I could, in solving that problem, there could be a business opportunity. And I think, so. I, I, and, I, and he's a very engaging guy, talks a lot of common sense. And we, we, it would be interesting feedback from the listeners, but we have talked about diving into specific themes that come through, come through the different podcasts and sales and marketing is something that's very close to both my and Keeman's heart. And we might talk about that in detail, but this guy is a pro sales guy with pro sales presentation uh, uh, insights. And he really, really knows his stuff. So that's a great thing to learn, to learn about. And now you can do, now it's your turn. So, so <laughs> David Spinks is uh, someone who, wrote a book about the about community management the business of community and he had a so his story was that he was a quite an isolated kid from an immigrant family uh, who really didn't feel he fit fitted in anywhere and then because he was into some video game he ended up running a video game community online and in that world he found community and he became aware of the value of community and this led through different uh insights into the situation where he set up an event for community leaders so the the community he set up the community of community builders and that was called cmx and that was his thing and community management has become a big deal in many different businesses and indeed Kimon was talking about tessa clark's business and the community around olio the food sharing and sharing app but this guy actually is a pioneer in this world because what he notices a lot of community builders and i'd put myself in that current category do it more as a labor of love as something that they do for fun and he said no this can be a business this is a business if it's being done for free by volunteers sooner or later it will collapse no that hasn't actually always happened nonetheless what you can learn from this guy is particularly a really important way to put potentially rocket fuel in your product development process, in your recruitment processes, in your customer retention. There's lots of business aspects to what the insights that David has, which I think are, are really important and really valuable. You know, his entrepreneurial story is cool as well because he ended up exiting, merging his CMX community with a software company called BV, Bevy, which provides provide services into this space. I think that's a, a billion dollar company. And there are the ups and downs of his business journey. And he's a very, one of these pretty successful American guys who's very modest along the way, isn't too full of himself, but knows his shit and had a, has, has a great story as well as an important business insight. So as an education, as an educational podcast, definitely listen to that one. And I would recommend reading the book. What about you, Kimon? Yeah, I liked, uh, well, as you said, I, I think what I like best about him is like super humble. And he was able to talk about, because um, he's done really cool stuff. I mean, he is, as you said, he is a pioneer. I learned a lot about community. And I think that that's a really cool thing. Uh, just a cool aspect of something that you could do uh, in your business. I, I did like that in his story. I don't know if you remember in his story. He, uh, I can't remember which one of the companies he, he went through, but one of them, um, they, what was it they offered him? He ended up having some equity the company because he was like, like employee five of, of, of some company and then he ended up having some equity and he ended up like you know they offered him something and he said no and he asked for like two or three times as much and they gave it to him <laughs> and then it exited like last like years like, like i think very soon after for like hundreds of millions of dollars and uh whatever i thought it was obviously for a lot of people they'd be like they might be sour or whatever i just the way he told that story i thought was really funny um was really funny actually and and self, I, sort of self-deprecating uh they, they, offered you... him, they offered him 5k and he asked for six they gave him six <laughs> and it would probably probably have been worth millions <laughs> and, exactly it was but but also i mean this is the the guys who bought him out 
actually made a terrible mistake, which was to offer equity too early to junior yes. people just when they arrived. And, you know, again, for someone listening, in your first company, you often take decisions, which a good advisor or mentors don't do that. You know, Say, yeah, sure, you can have equity after you've worked hard for a year and I'm sure that the fit is right. That was another one, I think, that was another one that came out even in Vasco was also about um, at which it's the flip side. At which time do you get uh, do you get uh, outside investment because you don't want to you know as a, as a, as an owner you want to get the timing right in terms so you don't get diluted too much. You want to basically get money as late as possible as in as infrequently as possible so your valuation so you you maintain as much of your equity. But yep. uh, sorry, back to David, just to to to, to comment on because I just wanted to mention on the community thing because I just think. Because I was like community, like, yeah, I imagine community for like, um, like Apple or like, you know, consumer products. But so I think I asked him about that. And, and he, but, but B2B, there's a lot of B2B, like you can, you can have B2B communities um, as well. And so I think that like, if you're, you know, if you, if you have a business and you're listening to this, I think that you should check this out because this is something that I wasn't really, you know, it makes a lot of sense. Basically, you get a bunch of people that love what you do or mm-hmm. love something. Basically, it may, doesn't necessarily have to be you and your product, but it could be something around the place where you are. And that could be a great place to have loyal, whether it's employees or clients or, you know, um, but it, 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 it's a powerful, it's a powerful tool. I actually introduced, introduced David Spinks to Marshall, the founder of the NBN, and we're talking about communities of either the hosts of people who do what came right. on the NBN or communities based around the hosts and the audience and we're we're not there yet and Marshall has to read the book first but you clearly there's potential value out there if you can get it right because people care about who they spend time with is you know they care about spending time with people with similar interests and there's this wonderful interest he said the less sexy the the field yes exactly the bigger the the opportunity and there's this dynamic community of software testers because in day-to-day life it seems so boring but if you're together with other software testers you really care and you've got it in common and um and marshall told me that the medieval the medievalists the medieval historians have the wildest academic conferences and you know they're famous for it because you know no one else thinks it's interesting at all and this is a chance to let your hair down and you know <laughs> uh, 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 and, and be, be, be a human and we're getting to the end of our list Kim. yeah the last one the last one the last one we did the end of season one we ended season one with a bang we had uh, Harvard professor Tom Eisenman on uh, as the final guest um, and he is a Harvard professor of entrepreneurship and so uh, I, well, one of the things I like best about this is he came prepared. He he watched our first intro podcast and he knew, Kimon, you don't like, uh, you don't believe in education. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be coming after me. And I was, it, it very, I have to be honest, I was, I was almost very nice. I was very interested, though, in trying to understand how can you teach this thing, this crazy thing called entrepreneurship? And obviously, who better to ask than a Harvard, uh, than a Harvard professor? And my take on the whole thing was that they've done a great job of quantifying what makes an entrepreneur successful. They have all these data points that they know, you know, uh, what, what, what is going to make them successful. But at the same time, it's very difficult. They're not able, because, because there's so many inter, intertwined aspects of it, it's very difficult to predict. Are you going to be successful? They can they can look at a set of data and say yes, this data means, but they won't be able to predict if you're going to be a successful entrepreneur. And that's because that's really the secret sauce stuff that nobody can predict. It's your childhood, it's your upbringing, it's the things that had. It's it's probably your DNA. It's probably genetic to some extent. There's some basic things that you have for whatever reason. There's a genetic aspect, then there's a background aspect. Um, but so I thought this was a really. But but he I had in all fairness. I have to give Tom credit. I was impressed with basically you can prepare entrepreneurs. You can give you can give successful people. Let's put it this way: if you were able to get a group of people together that had all the real whatever the you're going to make it stuff, they would get a tremendous value out of the education. The reality is, 
they're not able to pre-select all the people that all have all these, 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 these characteristics. So I'm sure a lot of people go on and are successful entrepreneurs, but he himself admitted a lot of them go on and are not able to have successful entrepreneurial careers. So I thought that was, anyway, I found it to be, uh, I, I really, I really enjoyed that one. You know, I mean, for, from my perspective, it's, it's a kind of privilege to in, interview someone at the top of the top of the tree. And the title of his book was why startups fail. And because a million and a half people download MBN podcasts every every month publicists for books get in touch with MBN and we're actually this this podcast will be podcast of the day and it's possible uh, and I don't I'm not sure I'm talking to Marshall we may run half a million ads across different MBN podcasts for this specific episode so the name of Tom Eisenman will be out there however the things that I took away the, the title of his book was why startups fail and he actually and this is something that came out in a he told us stuff about his backstory that we had the sense he doesn't often share. He had a really tough time as a child. You know, his father died. His father was an unsuccessful, uh, not very successful, sort of handyman entrepreneur type guy. And so he had a tough childhood and he and his siblings all went into very safe careers as I think they became all professors. And there was he saw this book as an entrepreneurial opportunity. He spotted that there aren't books about why startups fail, not done the way he did it. He discovered this because he had an, his own failed investment. And he was trying to think, how can it be that someone has so much knowledge as me about-, about That's startups? what was fascinating. That's what was fascinating. He invested, as the backstory, he invested in his student business. So he, so think of this, you're the Harvard business professor. You have the creme de la creme projects being presented to you. <laughs> he chose one of them and it didn't, and it didn't work out. I mean, that's like, yeah. that, that's interesting. Uh, and, 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 this, and, uh, but he particularly picks to pieces in um, great with irrefutable evidence why the lean startup model, which everyone regards as a Bible, isn't quite right. It's a very good model, but it's not, it's not complete. And there are things you need to do before you go into the lean startup mode that can save you endless heartache and depression and breakdown and bankruptcy. I mean, it's really, he doesn't, he doesn't pull any punctures. It's no, it was good. And he was, <laughs> and he, he was even critical of the one that he invested in. I, I believe that they, they they ran out of money. They didn't have enough uh, runway, basically. So they they probably should have they probably should have uh, they probably should have bootstrapped it a bit longer before they actually went to get money. Actually, because that's yeah. back to the that's back to the case of don't get money too early lesson. I yeah. think. Yeah, we we we've, we've just got a, a, a two or three more closing minutes, and I, I'd, I'd like to do a couple of things as we close. One is to thank all our guests because they all opened up, shared information with us and the listeners, which I'm sure not all of them uh, normally share about the backstory, what was important for them. And I also got the sense that I guess they often thanked us. They liked, they had this opportunity to tell the story of their life to, you know, I, I, neither Kimo nor myself would regard ourselves as the best business people in the world, but experienced business people who can bring some detailed questions and highlight things that, were important on their journey. So thank you to our guests. Thank you to you, the listeners as well. And I would say we are open to suggestions of people who've done something interesting and entrepreneurial in their lives. We, you know, we're, we may not be broadcasting podcasts for a few more months, but we will be on the lookout and lining people and up. And recording. And recording. So um, those are a few comments from me. Thank And thank you, Kimon, as a co-host. Thanks to the MBN team and Magda Fontakidis, Magda Bushkosh, who provides support in the background. And I think from your side, Kimon. Um, I know. I just think it's funny that, uh, and you and I joke about it, that, you know, the reason people like to be on the podcast and like, like it with us is that, like, you know, your wife or your husband doesn't want to... <laughs> <laughs> doesn't care that much about what you do and here you get to come and you get to talk for an hour about all all your success and actually there's there's people that are interested in, in listening to your story and asking you questions about it so i think it's a nice i, I think i think that may be part of the reason why we get the warm fuzzy <laughs> feeling from these people people we care about them and so and and they feel that well, so, we do we do we do we yeah. do <laughs> and it's, yeah. it, it is interesting for us and we're sharing it with a wider 
with a wider audience. And I and I, I would also say that one, one bit of feedback we've got occasionally is people want to hear more of Kimon. Uh, certainly I've heard of sometimes more of me, but if you're interested in our take on particular topics, we are considering a line of sort of thematic thematic uh, podcasts where we discuss entrepreneurial themes not with a guest and you know feedback about whether you think that's a good idea or not would be would be welcome we may do it anyways <laughs> and i don't know how people how do you want these people to provide the feedback richard can you what's what's the what's the uh what's the method of feedbacking at this point i think that i uh, sent me a short message saying that was an awesome <laughs> idea richard on twitter linkedin facebook or i'll just imagine you thinking it well we're coming up to the coming up to the time and it, so uh, so thank you very much for me goodbye from london and from you Kimon. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Richard. As I said at the beginning, thanks for actually getting me involved in this. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you for everybody. We actually have quite a few people. I think we're getting two to 3,000 downloads per uh, per podcast right now. Obviously, I think that'll probably continue to grow. I'm, I'm amazed at how, you know, how many, th there's so many people out there that want to even listen to this. And so thank you very much for your attention and your time. And uh, yeah, I look forward to doing this forward to season two. Thanks.